Um, I want to start with China. Uh, so you have um, obviously been talking to them forever. I know uh, I, I heard from one of our reporters that when you were out in California, you actually jumped into the car of the Chinese delegation while you were negotiating and took, went back to the hotel with them. <laughs> I think that was an interesting bit of diplomatic protocol. Um, well, I, I've, known, I've known, first of all, great to be with you all. Thank you for giving me a chance to share a few thoughts with you. I'm, I look forward to it. Um, I've known Xi Jinping for about 25 years. So I, I, I don't think it was so outrageous that we <laughs> choked around a little bit. Um, but uh, part of what we managed to do uh, in the agreement that we reached in Sunnylands is really based on some trust that we've built up over a period of time, which is at the core of good diplomacy. So uh, it paid off, and, and I think we came up with a pretty important series of steps forward with the Chinese, and we hope even, you know, I, I'll be meeting with him, uh, I think I'm meeting with him somewhere in the next day or so, or hours, mm -hmm. and we'll see where we go, whether we can do more. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that agreement, I mean, for one thing, you were still talking to him when no one was talking between U.S. and China, or almost no one was talking. Um, and, you, uh, and you reached an interesting agreement on renewables in China, right? Yes. So can you tell me what that was and then sort of how that plays out here? Well, because of the way policy has evolved in China, which is in a fairly formulaic and uh, rigid format, working its way up through the various agencies. Uh, once they had their national determined contribution, which is a 2060 date with uh, uh, a neutrality level, not even a reduction level in emissions, uh, President Xi proclaimed it, and there's very little capacity to move and change that. Uh -huh. so, so what we have to do is be creative and find ways to affect it, but not actually change the, the, the proclaimed target levels, but have the effect through the things we agreed to work on together in certain measures that you would, in fact, reduce the emissions to a certain degree. And that's what we really, we, we came to an agreement. China does not have all greenhouse gases in its NDC. So you have methane, predominantly, I mean, significantly methane, but also, uh, you know, uh, tropical ozone, you have uh, HFCs, other things that are left out of it. Mm -hmm. And that just doesn't get you where you need to go in terms of the challenge of the climate crisis. So we found a way to take some measures, specifically the tripling of the deployment of renewables with a very specific view that that will be sufficient to wind up with a reduction of emissions in the 2020s, which has the effect of moving things forward and accelerating a reduction. China, I, I have to say to you, is um, very well aware, acutely aware of the crisis now. They have been hugely dependent on coal through their entire economic development. Uh, they understand that there are challenges with that now. Uh, they have about 360 gigawatts of coal that is slated to come online, but they argue that it's going to be at very low capacity uh, and that those plants will be cleaner than the older plants they have, which are the ones they will begin shutting and moving into transition. Now, the proof is in the pudding, not in the stating of it, but um, that holds the potential of rap more rapid transformation than what they see. There's a second thing which you have to take note of. China is the world's largest uh, manufacturer of critical renewables, most importantly, solar and wind. And they are also the world's largest deployer of both. And they are deploying at a rate currently that is greater than all the rest of the world put together. So that is going to have a profound impact on another sort of measure, if you will, that if they do deploy the levels that we think may be possible, as much as 3,000 or certainly 25, 2,700 gigawatts 
of power over the next seven years, uh, that will, in effect, also move things forward much more rapidly. So rather than 2060, their date when actually they would peak and begin to go down will be moved up and be much faster. It's one of the things that gives me hope about this, that you're not just sitting there with a static situation there. They and many others are moving at a much more rapid pace. Um, and, uh, and we are now moving. The IRA has had a profound impact on development in the United States. I literally I just got this when, before I came in, and I'm uh, drawing from it because I haven't had a chance to finish reading the entire thing. But it uh, points out very significantly uh, uh, that the First Movers Coalition now represents the single largest demand signal for low carbon goods in history. Nearly 100 companies with over 100 commitments valued at about $13 billion. And we're seeing, I mean, Goldman Sachs just came up with a new analysis uh, regarding uh, where this is going to take us in terms of uh, Jobs and job creation. The U.S. energy workforce added about 300,000 jobs from 2021-2022, plus 3.8 percent growth, outpacing the growth rate of the overall U.S. workforce, which grew by 3.1. Clean energy jobs increased in every state and grew 3.9 percent nationally. This is before the IRA implementation, so we even see that going up a lot more. And um, I think that. Uh, what I'm trying to underscore to all of you, particularly the Wall Street Journal, is this is an economic opportunity unprecedented mm -hmm. in history. It will be bigger than the Industrial Revolution. It is already moving faster. We're going to see remarkable uh, transformation take place. And we're seeing now more money being allocated to renewables, to alternative, to clean energy, not just renewable, but clean energy, i.e., uh, SMRs, sustainable, uh, you know, small mo uh, modular reactors, uh, geothermal, uh, fusion. Uh, there are just huge potentialities that are really beginning to come yep. to life. And I think we're looking at an extraordinary and very encouraging a a set of economic opportunities for the United States particularly, because we are particularly good at allocating capital that way and attracting new technologies and, yeah. and letting the marketplace move and develop where we're going. And I see that happening now, which is why I don't think, you know, whoever's president of the United States, obviously I have my preferences, but uh, no one politician could now change where we are headed. No one's going to come in politically and say to Ford and General Motors and Mercedes and Volkswagen, who've all spent billions of dollars retooling their plants, that's done, folks. Katie, bar the door. No one's going back and saying, oh, let's go back to internal combustion engine cars. And that is going to happen throughout this new economy that is going to be developed now in the next years. Uh, <laughs> um, I want to just hit one Put your more. Money where your hands are. <laughs> I want to hit one more thing on, on, on China, but this is broader. Uh, there was uh, a bunch of talk about methane. Uh, in, uh, in your discussions with China and, and now here at COP. What, uh, what's happening there? I know it's a you know, super powerful greenhouse gas and it has a short life, so getting it out is super uh, important. Yeah, this is, <clears throat> this is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, this is about as important as any public issue could conceivably get. Methane is, is gas. I mean, gas is 87.7% methane. And when you burn it, then you have a CO2 problem. But when you don't burn it, or you burn, you're, 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 you have 80 to 100 times more destructive impact than with CO2 and other greenhouse gas. And in, that's in the near-term years, first 20 years or so. Beyond that, it's 20 times more damaging, destructive, than CO2. And so, uh, Right now, we have a thing called fugitive gas, which is the, the thawing of the permafrost in Siberia, in the Alaska, in the north, tundra, and so forth. Is You can go up and see the incredible dislocation of land, where it's right. huge undulations because it's thawed and it's 
changing, uh, it's also cracking houses, it's also right. cracking infrastructure used for extraction of fuel for Russia and others. So yep. there's some real challenges here. And, and methane, because of the leakage, because of the venting and the flaring. In Iraq, there's a massive amount of venting. In Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, I just met with the president of, of both Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan earlier this morning. There, we're going to work with them now, and they've agreed to work to capture their emissions, to produce, to to uh, resist the the um, leakage. And we have big announcements we will make. I'm not going to go into them here today, but we have a methane summit that we agreed to with China and with the UAE. We will be on the main stage in the in the at the center, I think, in a day or two, uh, and there we will have both Shia Jamwa and myself and Sultan Al Jaber talking about what we're going to do on methane and who's going to participate in it and how it's going to have an impact. And I think it's going to be one of the biggest things that comes out of this COP. But if we deal with methane, and, you know, I met eight times with the president of Mexico in the last year and a half. And we showed him how in Mexico, where they're flaring, they are losing, just burning, wasting. It's like taking out, you know, $100 bills and just burn them, throw them away. Uh, this is what's happening. $2.8 billion a year of their budget is just going up into the atmosphere and polluting. So that's a reason that it's massively important for us to be reducing this fugitive gas, which is harder to capture. But now, with, with satellite technology, we have the ability to trace methane as never before. And you may recall in a co competitor newspaper on the front page, there was a big story with a big purple blob showing where in Russia there was a massive mega leakage which has unbelievable damaging impacts on the planet. So we have to find ways to trace this fugitive gas, harness it, you got to capture it. And uh, the satellite now gives us the ability to be able to trace it and track it on a daily basis. We can target specific areas. It's also very relevant to the footprint of big corporations. If you're an international corporation and you've said, well, we're going to be at 2030, we're going to have scope one and two done, and we're going to do scope three, blah, blah, blah. We will have the ability to measure that. And so there's no phony promising greenwashing that's going to be able to take place going forward as this technology is more deployed and people are tracing what's happening. That's going to have a profound effect, I think, on a lot of things, including asset, uh, asset management, asset ownership, which is suddenly going to be looking at their assets differently because with disclosure, which will happen as a result yes. of it, you're going to have a fiduciary responsibility uh, to understand what your investments are and what the impact is going to be of all of this. So the marketplace will feel this. And you all know a whole bunch of insurance companies have now stopped insuring people, in, at least in the United States. Think about that. So that changes assets, that changes business decisions, that changes a whole bunch of things down the food chain. So I think we're just living in a whole new area of, of new territory, uncharted territory, which the scientists, by the way, are saying about the evidence that Mother Nature is giving us on a daily basis around the world. Scientists are now saying, we're terrified, we're alarmed, and they're absolutely saying, we are in uncharted territory because the scientists for years now have told us there are tipping points. And the tipping points, you can, you can go to the, the Potsdam Institute uh, run by a great scientist called Johann Rockström. And he has defined some of these planetary boundaries which show we may be past a tipping point on coral reefs, on the Barents Sea, on permafrost, and both the Arctic and the Antarctic, where incidentally, this past summer in the Arctic, it was 70 degrees Fahrenheit above normal, and in the Antarctic, it was 100 degrees Fahrenheit above normal. And we've now seen a massive dislocation in the Antarctic of a, of a, a massive ice sheet that was grounded in the mud, but because it's diminished now in size, melting, it's no longer grounded, it has moved and is moving out towards Georgia Island where, you know, it will melt 
and it will contribute much more rapidly to sea level rise, which is what scientists are telling us is happening. Um, the, so, please speaking of sea level rise and, and the weather that we get from, from uh, a warming climate. So this loss and damage fund uh, was agreed on yesterday. It had been talked about since last year, and it seems like we've nailed down the last details. One of the things I wanted to ask you is, it's going to be run through the World Bank initially. Initially. Only initially. initially. Yes. And um, so this is the new World Bank under Ajay Banga, which is supposed to do better with climate. Correct. Do you think they're going to succeed? Well, I can't predict that they'll make the right investment choice or that they're going to do it, but certainly he was hired with the notion that he comes with massive business experience. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, we believe that the structure is such in the World Bank that they will have the ability to make, hopefully, wise decisions on that. But what we have done with the World Bank and all the other development banks is begin to try to make more capital available, more lending available, in order to leverage the deployment of private sector funds, which are in the trillions. But a whole lot of those trillions are restrained and pulling back, looking, uh, you know, I, I mean, basically, and you understand this. I certainly understand it. It's, you know, somebody managing money or deciding they're going to invest wants to make money or <laughs> uh, at least, uh, I mean, either usually one of two or three things, right? You want to make the most amount of money you can as fast as you can, or you want to make the safest amount of money you can make, or a combination of the yep. three, right? So. How do you deploy that money? Well, you're going to have to provide some de-risking, maybe some concessionary funding, some sort of blended finance. This is what we've done with Indonesia, with mm -hmm. Vietnam, with the so-called JETPs, which are the Just Energy Transition Partnerships. But the key to it, there's no mystery to this. We're, we're trying to make money do what it can do at its best, which is when it's deployed you know, in an exciting new venture technology, Somebody hopes they're going to make a lot of money. And, and, and so we need to bring those trillions to the table so that people are comfortable that they've got a bankable deal. And one of the ways we're going to get the bankable deals, we think, is through the voluntary carbon market, where we are now have a new initiative we're announcing here at the, at the COP. Uh, not announcing. We will be giving it full blossom in terms of the structure that it will have. We announced it last year in Sharm el Sheikh. And it is a new uh, credit or offset, which will be v very high in its environmental integrity, very transparent and accountable with respect to guardrails to avoid greenwashing, but very clear in its ability to attract capital that will be spent in order to uh, provide concessionary funding that can then help to leverage that money out into the marketplace. And it's the only way we're going to get the kind of money we need to meet this challenge because no government, no government anywhere has enough money, uh, nor even the capacity evidently in today's political world to deploy it. So we've got to find a way to get the private sector uh, big time at the table to solve this problem. No government's going to solve this. I believe it's going to come from the private sector. I believe it's going to come because fusion or battery storage or direct air carbon capture or hydrogen, something is going to break through because that is our nature. We're really good at, uh, look at what we did with COVID-19, look at what we've done historically. We will innovate. We will be creative. We will produce something that will change the price point. And when that changes, you'll see the money begin to flow much more rapidly. And I think fusion is an example. I just went up to Commonwealth Fusion in Massachusetts, and there are about eight or ten really competitive fusion companies right now, slightly different technologies in some cases, or many in a number of the cases. But I, I, when I was a, a senator in representing Massachusetts in the 1980s and 90s, I, I was a very much supportive of this, and we put millions of dollars into it, MIT. Well, the person at MIT was doing it left to go in the private sector. They now raised a mass of money to do this. They're building out a full-scale plant. They will be producing energy through a fusion reactor in about 2028, 20, 29, 
And that just could be the game changer, folks, conceivably. So I think that's the kind of thing that's going to begin to happen here. And when you look at the fact that last year, more money went into non-fossil fuel investment than fossil fuel, you see a trend line that is beginning to take hold. And the IEA has identified that they've, they've suggested, they have not suggested, they have declared, they have seen and detected a terminal decline in fossil fuel demand as of a couple of years from now right. as electric vehicles and deployment of renewables are coming online. So this ought to give anybody who is convinced of the evidence and believes we're in crisis some confidence and hope that uh, really we're in a new, new, new time. I want to I call you out on that a little. So no one's really willing to give up most people, most countries are not willing to give up anything, it seems, to address climate change. Right. So, I agree with that. So it seems like we're basically relying on technology. And so fusion, you mentioned, yeah. we don't have it yet. Green hydrogen, we have almost none. Carbon capture, we have almost none. We really are. This is, this is a bit of a leap. If these things don't work, where are we? That's not accurate entirely. Let me, let me okay. but it's a really worthwhile area to explore. President Biden and the administration and myself and others, we're not asking people to sacrifice. We're not asking people to give up something. In fact, we believe very deeply that there is a better quality of life on the other side of this transition. And I'll be very specific about that. I just read today that uh, there's a new analysis that shows that about 8 million plus people are dying every year because of lousy air quality around the world. Where does that come from, folks? It's called pollution. What is the pollution? Greenhouse gases, particularly coal burning. So the particulates of coal travel around the world, drop in rainfall. They are changing the chemistry of the ocean itself. More than it has been changed in millions of years. And the higher acidity of the ocean changes life for sea life, for crustaceans and other, uh, you know, uh, fish, fauna, you name it. And, and that's a real problem. 51% of the oxygen we breathe comes from the ocean. And as we load the ocean up with nitrate overload and chemicals and runoff, we got 500 dead zones around the world in parts of the ocean that won't grow anything. Are you kidding me? And, and 8 million people are dying every single year prematurely because of the quality of the air. More cancer, more emphysema complications, more heart disease complications. Uh, this is insane to be thinking that, you know, we're asking people to give up. We're, we, we, there was a time in the last years that uh, we might have gone to war to protect our energy sources. And now we're the largest oil and gas producer in the world, and we do it because we have mostly the shale gas and the capacity to frack and do what we do. Uh, and again, that's technology that produced that. Right. But gas will have a confrontation with the future in the future. Right now, if you take gas, you say, okay, we're gonna replace, replace a coal plant, we're gonna replace an oil-fired plant, whatever. You're automatically getting a 30 to 50% reduction in emissions. But once you've got that, and you get to 2030, and you have to then do within 20 years your reduction to be net zero by 2050, you're gonna have to be reducing those emissions of gas sufficiently mm -hmm. that you're meeting your downward commitment. And I'm, I, I think there's a real issue of whether, I mean, Fatih Barol at the IEA will say declaratively, there is no way for CCUS to be able to be sufficiently capable across the board that you can get net zero 2050. Mm -hmm. You have to have some capture to get to net zero. But when you say we don't have the technologies, we have technologies. Solar is 85% down in price right. from where it was. It's cheaper than these other fossil fuels. Wind power, we now have turbines that have the ability to produce, you know, maybe 15 gigawatt, uh, 15 megawatts and, and growing in capacity. So it doesn't take as big a field or as much to be able to produce a gigawatt, two gigawatts in places where you make a difference. You could run a desalinization plant. You can run, uh, you know, a, a dedicated, uh, electricity need or power heat need 
for the heavy industries, for steel, cement, concrete, et cetera. Right now, we started something called the First Movers Coalition. We have about 100 companies, the biggest companies in the world, who joined this coalition. Google, Apple, Microsoft, Salesforce, FedEx, United Airlines, Delta, Ford Motor Company, General Motors. I mean, big, really successful companies. And they have pledged that they are going to do certain things in their business practices in order to excite the marketplace and send a demand signal. So what are they doing? Well, Volvo and General Motors and Ford have agreed that 10% of the steel they buy to make their cars will be green steel. Lafarge Holson, largest cement maker in the world, making green cement. People are buying it not because it's green, but because it's better cement without the carbon. I mean, you see all kinds of better things that come out of this. So if you have 8 million people a year dying because of bad air quality, every summer in the United States of America, the largest cause of children being hospitalized in America is environmentally induced asthma, air quality. We spend about 55 billion or more, that's an old figure. Right now it's probably more taking care of that. Wouldn't it be smarter not to make the problem in the first place? to have cleaner air, breathe cleaner air, to not have the impact on our buildings that, you know, the acidity. I mean, there are any number of reasons to say this is not a sacrifice. You don't give up anything. You get a better quality of life. Now, we're not forcing anybody to go buy that electric vehicle, but people are doing it. Right. And if you're going to pay 80 bucks or 100 bucks to fill up your tank, and yet you can drive up, as I do, I have a Tesla and I drive up, maybe 15, whatever it is, dollars, 20 maximum. And, and um, you know, I don't have any problem finding a place to charge or do this. It's just amazing technology. Yeah. So more power to that. I keep hearing uh, the word here, uh, unabated. And so the idea that uh, we no longer want unabated fossil fuels, right? They have to be abated, which means carbon capture. Um, it, that word is coming from, you know, oil and gas people mainly. Is that something that we should be accepting or is that just a way for the fossil fuel producers to continue to produce and say somehow this is better? <laughs> That's a debate. Um, first of all, I'm guided by the science. Uh, and I can tell you, honestly, there is zero politics or ideology in any decision that the President Biden has made or the administration has made. We are driven by the science. And I began hearing that science back in 1988 when I was in the Senate and Jim Hansen came to testify to us. And a whole group of us in the Senate, Republican and Democrat alike. I remember, you know, Mac Mathias from Maryland, Republican, John Warner, Republican, John Hines, Republican. We had a whole bunch of folks came together and we all went to Rio in 1992. We were part of the Earth Summit. And everybody decided this was a serious problem. We had to do something about it. And then we, uh, over the years, we, we got to a point where the voluntary process wasn't working. So in Kyoto, they tried for, for a mandatory process. And that didn't work. Mm -hmm. I was in the Senate. I managed the, that in the floor of the Senate. And the Bird hegel Amendment came out and said, well, if China doesn't have to reduce, we're not going to reduce, which doesn't, you know, not, it doesn't keep you from getting killed, but it's, you don't know, reduce. Um, but we then discovered in Paris the secret formula, which is everybody writes their own plan. You live by a standard of meeting the needs. And, and that's why we, this is so, such an important cop, because this will be the first stock take appraisal of whether or not how we're doing relative to what Paris said we needed to do to keep 1.5 degrees. And so I think we're, we're in a place where uh, we're, we're, we're seeing a whole set of different options come available to us. But with respect to this idea of unabated, um, it has to be abated because we have to reduce emissions. Right. If it's unabated, there's really no excuse for it today. So there is a movement, which also will be, you'll hear about in the next two weeks, to say that there should be no new permitting of any 
unabated coal plant anywhere in the world. Why? Because coal is the dirtiest fuel of all. You don't need to be burning coal. You could move more rapidly to any number of other options, and we want people to move in that direction. So whether we get that through or not, I don't know. But the reason for stressing the concept of abated is this. If a, if a, if a company comes into you, oil and gas company, and says, hey, we're going to capture all our emissions, and we're already capturing X amount, and we've now spent X billions of dollars to be able to have pipes and other capacity to take it and travel and put it underground forever. Then are you going to say, OK, you, you, too bad, we're putting you out of business anyway? I don't think that's the way it works usually in our country. I think that the marketplace is going to make that decision. Now, CCUS is going to be expensive, folks. I don't think the price point of that is going to hit something, and when you combine it with nimbyism, I mean, we already have huge permitting problems. You think you're going to permit a whole bunch of pipes to go through communities and start tracking and take, I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. But I do know this, that, that the marketplace works pretty effectively at resolving these kinds of choices. And Vicky Holu, at Occidental, is committed to 100% carbon yep. capture. They're all in on carbon capture. Will it work? I don't know. I'm not sure she'd say. It, it, they're capturing, yeah. but can you bring it to scale? Can you do it at the pace you need? Can you I don't know the answer to those questions, but to come back to your initial question, you know, how do we do this? We, we don't have these technologies. Are you asking people to give up something? No. And this goes to that. The, the uh, fact is we do have enough of the technologies mm -hmm. in solar and wind alone to meet the target we need to meet for 2030, which is a 43% minimal reduction of emissions. Now, Germany is currently heading to 80% renewable deployment. Uh, there's another country I just saw the other day and told me they're doing 80% also. I saw a country last night, uh, a European country, they're going to be at about 50%. They're not worried about baseload. They see that they're able to balance today. And with AI, we have so much more ability to work out the balancing and to be ahead of the curve. And to, so there's a whole new world waiting us of technology capacity to control things that make a difference. And I think you're going to see more and more green molecules and more and more green electrons being become of that solution yep. because it's going to be affordable, it's going to be smart, and it's going to get the job done. Uh, we're out of time, but I'm going to give you one more question. But first, I just want to thank you for coming out. Uh, I want to thank you for wearing a button supporting uh, yeah. Evan Gershkovich, uh, our reporter who's been detained in Russia uh, f for almost 250 days. Uh, so we wish he was here reporting like he should be. Um, I want to ask one last thing, just a quick answer. Um, you turn 80 next week. Uh, your colleague... Sorry, I'm leaving now, folks. <laughs> Out of here. <laughs> your, your, your counterpart in China, who you've known for all these years, yeah. is retiring. Yeah. Is this something of a changing of the guard? You've accomplished so much at COP. Do you see this as a moment where we're going to, some of the people who've been here are going to be moving on, and now it's sort of a time for, for action and different folks? I, I have no idea. <laughs> okay. I mean, do I think, that be, I don't know what decisions people will make. I'm, you know, whether I'm in the public or private sector, I'm going to stay at this because the key now is going to be implementing on the private side and getting these things done. But we need to, we need to win this battle. And I have no other plan. Right now, I'm focused on the next two weeks to get the job done.